Well, as we continue in worship this morning, if you would turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. I know some of you were thinking, no, not 1 Corinthians, right? <laughs> yeah. See, we do actually complete things here, right? Men, right? <clears throat> This is, of course, next Sunday is Easter, and this Friday is Good Friday, and so uh, if you just continue to back up a little bit, this is Palm Sunday, right? Uh, This is the Sunday where Jesus came into Jerusalem. He's gone through Jericho, and he's coming into Jerusalem, what we call the triumphal entry, and uh, since we've finished 1 Corinthians, I'd like to take this week and and next week, really, of course, of Easter to focus on this moment in history. Uh, a vital moment in history. And we'll see in this text of John 12, and we're going to look at verses 12 through 19. As John, John records for us this moment when Jesus comes in, and John also does something uh, that he likes to do throughout his gospel. He likes to kind of tell us, uh, those who witnessed it, what they were thinking, right? How they perceived it or what was going on. And so out of this passage of Scripture, we don't only see Jesus coming, we see the crowd, of course, Uh, But John gives us the response of his disciples, what they thought of it. He kind of tells us about the people and who were there and why they were there. He gives us an insight into their motive. And then he tells us what the Pharisees were were thinking and saying, right? It's quite quite interesting as we look at this. Um, But it's vitally important, and I call this this sermon uh, the true king because what we see in this passage is uh, we see people responding to Jesus, but it's not the Jesus uh, who was born in Bethlehem, raised in, in Nazareth, right, and uh, was the second person of the Trinity who went and lived the perfect life, the carpenter's son of Joseph and, and Mary, and went to the cross. That's not the Jesus they're desiring, uh, as we'll read this passage here in a moment. And yet, well, despite all those things, Jesus is demonstrating with his activity exactly the Jesus we need. Uh, there is a reason he is, he's coming this way. There's a reason he's approaching this scene and riding on a donkey. He's communicating. Jesus is always teaching. He's always fulfilling scripture. There's no one like him. He alone is the true king. And how we respond to the gospel, right? There's only two ways, a positive or a negative, right? There's no gray area or middle ground or let me think about it for a while. You know, that is a no, Right? Because Jesus tells us, you're either for me or against me. There's, there's no middle ground. And in this passage, even in the triumphal entry, we see uh, this separation. We see the two, really the two groups. Uh, John does a wonderful job. Well, that sounds funny. He's writing scripture. He did a good job here, John. Uh, <laughs> but he does a good job of seeing it in the context of the, of the, of the activity of Jesus raising Lazarus. Right? There's great excitement, and Jesus tells us all these things, or John rather, about, about who Jesus is and what he's doing and how he raised Lazarus, and then it comes into this triumphal entry. You know, the scene is set, right, for, for the king to come. And the king comes, and in four days, right, five days ish, you have a, a, a group, and, and some scholars estimate around 500,000 people are congregating, right? Um, coming together and shouting. They go from, Hosanna, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they attach that, that statement. You know, the king of Israel. Here's our guy, right? We got him. And Jesus does something that totally is opposite of what they want. And in a few short days, that same crowd is now shouting, crucify him. It's very important for us today. There's, there's always, we know the deceiver is active. There's always a counterfeit to Christ. And we know Jesus will always, the enemy will always attack Jesus, always attack the authority of God's word. That will always happen. Uh, there are those who will, uh, who will say this is Christianity and compromise it. But it's vital for us to come back and say, no, my faith, like Paul, I have put my resolve and, and firm conviction in the lordship of Christ. I know in whom I have believed, as he tells Timothy. We need to have that same conviction, but we need to make sure that the Jesus that we are believing on is the Jesus of Scripture and not some congregated or, or conjured, rather, Jesus 
uh, that we make up in our minds. Because it's only the true king that truly saves. Like many testimonies, there's a story of a Russian countess who became a believer, believed on Jesus Christ for salvation, and the czar didn't think that was too adequate because she was making known her belief, making known her testimony. So he had this wonderful idea. He thought, well, I'll take this countess who's used to the plush and easy life, and I'll put her in prison with the low life, the, the, the lowliest of those of Russia, and simple 24 hours will change her tune. 24 hours came and went. The countess is in front of the czar, and he asks her, right, with a mocking way, are you ready to get rid of that silly Jesus? And her response in a calm manner is to say, I, I have known more joy with Christ in the, in the lowest of our society than I've ever known in the courts of the czar. That's following the true king. And that's what this, this passage really reveals. Jesus is coming. He's heading to the cross. It's not what the crowd wants. But this is who he is. And this is how John records it, beginning in verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it was written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him, because they had heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let me offer a brief prayer. Father, once again, we call upon your great name and we ask that your spirit be with us, teaching us from your word, opening our eyes, God, instructing us. And I pray now, Lord, that the truths of this passage would not simply uh, fade away or the, the evil one would not snatch them away, but, Lord, they would take root in us and grow our confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ and who the true king really is. Lord, let uh, me be taken away that every thought in life be fixed upon you for that purpose, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we come to this scene, right, and, and if you're familiar with the gospel accounts and reading through uh, whether, what other gospel, but Jesus' activity, this is kind of strange, right? Normally when there's a crowd, we see Jesus slipping away and, and going off, right, and, and saying his time is not, uh, not yet, but this is completely opposite, right? Here, Jesus, in context, he has raised Lazarus. There is, uh, the Pharisees are out to get him. They want to arrest him. John tells us this in the end of chapter 11, verse 57. Um, John tells us they are looking to arrest him, anyone that has record of him. They're so frustrated with the testimony of Christ that in verse 9 of chapter 12, they, uh, John tells us not only are they after Jesus, but they're looking to Lazarus to put him back in the tomb, Right? He says in verse 9, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And then verse 10, But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. It gives you a picture of their heart, right? John sets the scene for us. This is uh, where they're at. They're looking to get Jesus he raises Lazarus, which only compounds their frustration and their desire, Lord, uh, to get at Jesus. And yet we see Jesus do something very opposite, right? He does that often, doesn't he? Opposite the world. But Jesus goes and grabs a donkey, and he hops on this donkey, 
and he rides into Jerusalem. It's almost as if he's embracing it, and of course the time has come. And what Jesus is really doing, and, and as we look at these events, he is really forcing the hand, right? His time has come. Calvary is ahead of him. This is the Passion Week. He understands this. No one else is getting it, of course, right? As, even as John tells us. But he is forcing the actions of the religious leaders. They, you know, he simply knows that uh, they can't do anything with this kind of popularity, Right? So he's going to come in opposite of the popularity, which we'll see here in a moment, um, which will help the religious leaders, in essence, turn this crowd from shouting Hosanna to crucify. So I looked at this passage, and I simply have two points with a few subpoints under each one, and the notes are in your, in your bulletin. But I want to look at verses 12 and 15 and simply look at it, and in, 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 there's two things happening here. Right, first we see that the true king, right, Christ, he reveals our sin problem. You and I don't think as we should, right? We're now as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, right? We have the Spirit working and helping us. But we look upon the, this moment in history and there are those looking upon Jesus and, and not understanding what's going on. There is a sin problem. And in the context of this sin problem and those even shouting that we want some nationalism, we want the Romans done away with, right? In the context of that, we see that the true king, in the context of these things, also uh, reveals God's redemption. See, our sin problem is so bad that God knows what we need, but we don't want it, right? Here, here is salvation, and we're saying no, in the context of this, here, here's what we see. And so under A, I simply put verses 12 and 13. Our sin problem is looking for something Jesus is not. Now that kind of sounds a little odd. Isn't it like Jesus is lacking? Jesus is not lacking, nor is God, right? He is the second person of the Trinity. He's not lacking. The sin problem is on us. We, are, we want to conjure Jesus in our own way. John says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast... When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches and palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So the people are excited. They're looking for something, and Jesus is showing up on a donkey, right? This isn't what they pictured. They desire a king to come and, and to and to simply wipe out the, the, the Romans, set up his kingdom to be the king of Israel. They took scripture from Zechariah uh, chapter 9, 9, I believe, and, and they're coming and, and singing this out, right, as if they understand this. But then they simply move from, from Zechariah to this moment in time, and they say, this is the king. This is the guy we want. Finally, God's going to do something we want, namely deal with the Romans. The proof is in their actions, right? We have this crowd assembling. They're coming. They're taking palm branches, right? The palm branch was a symbol of national, uh, nationalism, really Jewish nationalism, right? They had this idea. This is what they're saying. We're going to proclaim this guy to come to be the king who's going to deal with all our problems. They're shouting the word, Hosanna. Right, which simply means save us now. Do you think they're they're desiring a savior upon a cross? No. They want deliverance from the Romans. Save us now, Hosanna, save us now, you're the king. See the crowd is assembling and coming out and saying, You're it, you're the one. We have made you into our own image. This was the problem of the Pharisees all over the place. See, they would have no problem with Jesus if he just fit, fit into their, their view and their understanding. The people are the same way. This is what we want, right? The king of Israel, Hosanna, right? This is the guy. Just fit into what we think you should be. And guess what, Jesus? What we want you to do is to take care of this Roman problem. And isn't it amazing how damaging sin is? This is our problem. We don't think right about Christ. We don't think right about the gospel. 
Sin has blinded us to the truth. There's a story of a Chinese boy who wanted to learn more about, about jade, the precious stone jade. And so he went to his to teacher who, who knew about these things, and the teacher put, in, without him knowing, jade in his hand, and he held it. And he said, hold this for a while. And the, and the student didn't understand what was going on. He says, hold this while I lecture. And so he would talk about philosophy and things of life and things I'm sure he made up. And this went on for an hour and then he gave it back. And then the son or the student would do this for multiple times. Finally, he came to a place where he said, this isn't it. And all along, the teacher had been placing it in his hand, right? And he said, this isn't it. And right in front of them, think about how damaging sin is, is he's, Christ is right in front of them, and they're asking for something different. They're citing Scripture, they're singing from Scripture. Clearly the, the crowd is, is right together, and then it's happening, and this is what we want, but they've created Christ in their own image. This is the problem of the church today. This is not just their problem, this is our problem. See, what happens today in our own lives is that we have an experience in life or we go through something and then we turn around and we, we say, well, that's how God is. When in reality, we must take that experience and come back to the word of God and say, no, but this is what his word says. This is who God is. So in the context of this, the, the crowd desiring something, right? We want something out of Jesus. It's just not what Jesus is bringing, Right? Here's the answer. This is what happens today, right? Then what, is, what does the church do? Well, if sin is our problem and people don't want Christ, let's package Christ in a way that, that is very tangible, that's desirable to people. Right? Well, what, do you, what do you have when you do that? You can create a crowd, right? But they don't have the Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, the one who comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. But when it ultimately goes to the cross, you have a different Jesus. So in the context of this, we see our, our sin problem. We don't think right. Here's the problem is we don't know that we need Christ. Sin has blinded us. But despite these things, and this is verses 14 and 15, God's redemption provides what we need. Look what Jesus does. Then Jesus, right, seeing the crowd, all these people shouting his name, singing Hosanna. He says, um, or he doesn't say, but it, the, John says, Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, he said on it, as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. See, Jesus presented himself as a true king. It's just not the king they wanted. Right? This is how you get a group of people right, to, to sing this and to praise this and days later say, Crucify him. This is it. Just like the precious stone in front of them, they don't see it. Jesus comes on a donkey. They wanted him to come on a war horse. It's purposeful that Jesus is coming on a donkey. Don't miss sight of this. He is communicating and he's teaching the whole uh, uh, group of people, all the people that are there. He's saying, I haven't come to do what you want. Right? I've come to do what is necessary and what is needed. I would imagine all of some of these Jews would have, would have been a little bit offended at this, already out of the gate. Wait, what is he doing? I can't believe I pulled this palm branch down, right? He's coming on a donkey. He's coming in humility. See, Jerusalem, right, and the Jews of Jerusalem were offering Jesus the whole kingship. You're, you're the king. We're giving it to you. Here's the, the nationalism. Everything is here, right? We, we understand it's going to be a militant thing, and you're going to take over. And Jesus, by riding in a donkey, is rejecting that offer. It's not why he's come. This is how you get a crowd, right, from, from uh, Sunday, Palm Sunday, to be excited about Christ, and days later they are yelling, crucify him. This is how it is. See, if John is, is saying that the people were coming together and they were, they were quoting Zechariah 9, verse 9, and I'm going to read 9 and 10 just so you understand. This is what they're quoting and how they changed it. Zechariah says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. 
He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And in verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And they took the verse and said, blessed is he who comes, right? Here he is, the king of Israel. And Jesus is riding on a donkey. We can see, right, following the verse, how strongly he was rejecting what they wanted. I've come to bring peace. And talk about a contrast here. This is a very, I think for us, a very profound warning to us. You and I exist in a culture, we live in a culture that is against Christ. It always has been that way, right? The psalmist encourages us, like, we shouldn't fear any man, right? We should speak. So we have to be discerning and wise, but yet we should be bold, right? We have a message. We have the answer in the context of confusion and a bunch of people who, who don't know they need Christ and he's right in front of them. They're getting frustrated at him because he didn't come on a war horse, right? He's on a donkey, They understood the symbolism. They understood what is happening. That's not his purpose. It wasn't their purpose, but it's what they need. We see this in our own life, right? The culture we live with, the things we endure, those those people we interact with who are uh, in opposition to the gospel. This is what's going on. They don't know they need Christ. And yet, we as the voice and the hands and feet of Christ need to be explaining him to them. So we look at this king, he's coming on a donkey. We see that he is righteous. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This is who he is. This is where uh, he's going to the cross. He will bring about salvation. We see his humility. He's humble. He's riding on a donkey. He's coming in peace. And the donkey was a sign in earlier days. We saw the judges and David and Solomon rode on a donkey. It was a sign of coming in peace, not war. Jesus is rebuking, right? They're thinking. How often have you and I come to a place where we haven't thought right, right? We can say, well, I've been guilty of that. I haven't thought right about the scriptures, and so we must continually come back. This is why we always say reform and come back to the Bible, Begin with the Bible, right? We start with Scripture, the right propositions of Scripture, and then we assess and look upon life and our situations. We're not to go the other way around where we have life and situations, and then we say, well, that's who God is. Let me just throw that on the Bible, right? We're going the wrong way. And Jesus clearly, in this simple triumphal entry, right? This is what's happening. He's exposing, right, what we want and what we need, What we want, right, is our own Jesus who gives us cake and allows us to eat it too, right? Where we can justify sin and and just live any way we want. That's the Jesus we want. That's the Jesus of the prosperity gospel. That's the Jesus of the seeker model. That's the Jesus they're talking about. You don't really have to change. Just make sure you come and, and buy, you know, leave your money before you leave. I mean, that's what they're saying. But the real Jesus of Scripture is radically different. And even in the triumphal entry, we see the contrast. We have a society that resists Christ, that rejects Christ, and yet we are to speak this Christ. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you're saying some things, counseling a person, you've built that relationship, and then you say, you know what, man, what I'm about to say, you may not like, but you need to hear it. Hopefully you have friends like that in your life who will tell you truthful things. Hopefully at some point in life you can be a friend like that. And hopefully that comes to a conversation where you're talking about Jesus. And the one you're trusting in, that's not the one of Scripture. Jesus doesn't just simply give you your your right, your best life now so you can live any way you want. Jesus calls us to discipleship. See, it's really popular today with progressive Christianity to simply say he's just an example, right? Jesus came just to show us how to live. Isn't that amazing, right? If you were to take that and say, okay, let's let's work that thought out. 
If you were to talk to someone and say, if Jesus just simply came to be your example, you know, what you're saying is if we just follow Jesus, everything will be all right. Yes, if we just follow Jesus, everything will be all right. Well, are you sinless? Have you ever sinned? No, I, of course I've sinned. Well, how can you follow Jesus? What you need is a Savior, right? Remember, the, the enemy will always attack the authority of Christ, who Christ is. Always attack his word. They'll repackage it, try to deceive you, right? Deceive his church. But this is vitally important right here in the triumphal entry. Jesus sets the contrast. I know what you want, but this is what you need. And in four or five short days, right, we see this crowd turn from Hosanna. Here's the king. Yeah, crucify him. So as John explains that, we see what Jesus is doing. We see him fulfilling prophecy. We see all this happening. We, like, we see the contrast. Well, what are we to do with it? Right? It's vitally important that here we're speaking now ultimately to believers. Right? If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here is some application for us to follow this true, this true king. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you must speak to me after the service. One of our elders Let's, let's fix that. Let's communicate Christ. Let's have a time of prayer. Let's believe on him. Because outside of Christ, there really ultimately is no, no hope, right? The wrath of Calvary was poured upon Christ. He is our substitution. So going on from this scene, and of course John is picking up on it. Here's how the people, here. how do they react to this? Kind of why he's writing. The disciples are looking at it. The people are looking at this scene. Jesus is on a donkey. The Pharisees have their opinion on it. So on the second, my second point here is simply in verses 16 through 19. It says the true king demands full devotion, right? And looking at these different groups and what do we learn? What should we grab from this? And my first point is, you know, as John places us in the story, so to speak, my first point is follow Christ with an unyielding heart, right? The disciples, they did not understand. Does that seem surprising? Right? We see that throughout the, the gospel. They just didn't get it. Right? And I can imagine, uh, I have this in this, I don't know if this is right or not, but I imagine that there were many times the disciples had that look on their face of like, uh, what? <laughs> and we know that look, right? And I imagine that there's times in, in this and even here where they're looking on this and going, what is happening? And it's not as if Christ didn't tell them, right? He communicated every time Jesus talks of this moment that he will be betrayed. He's going to go to Calvary. Here's what's going to happen. He always tells them he's going to rise. Don't worry, on the third day I will rise. The disciples never asked him, that's recorded for us, hey, what is the resurrection? What do you mean you'll rise, right? It's always you won't die. They just don't, they don't process it. They don't, they're not getting it. Can't be too harsh on them. You and I being there, we probably had the same look on our face, right? But in verse 16, this is what I said, that his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, right? Remember John's, John's writing back at this moment as he's communicating, he's, he's giving us the past and, the, and so far as they went forward, right? But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him, And that they had done these things to him. Right? There is a moment in the disciples where they don't get it. And then they get it. Right? And ultimately, they all got it. But just by way of example, Matthew 20, 18 and 19. Listen to the words of Jesus when he's telling him about this this moment. He says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed into the chief priests, to the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify. On the third day, he will rise again. Right? There it is. The third day, we will rise again. They never ask about that. They never question about that. Right? Other than Peter's one, you will not surely die. So we see in this, right, Jesus is not passive. He is Lord over all of this. And we go back to that progressive Christianity that says, no, Jesus didn't come to die. No, this is exactly why he came. Right? This was the, the covenant fulfillment. This is the covenant in his blood. This is the purpose, the will of the Father. And he is Lord over it. Jesus coming into Jerusalem isn't going, you know, I hope this works out okay. No, he's Lord over all of this. Jesus is God, right? He's in the middle of this. 
He's provoking the, the leaders to force their hands, right, to, to, to turn the crowd. This moment of Calvary uh, is about to happen. So he's not passive in any of this. And the disciples many times have looked upon the situation and just simply did not understand what the Lord was doing. Often in our own lives, I mean, if you had a moment where ordinary things have turned out to be a moments of, of life change for someone, I'd imagine we're going to get to heaven and we're going to run into people who said, do you remember that one day? And you said this, or you took time to do this, or you comforted me, or you walked with me, and you go, man, I, I barely remember you, of course, in heaven. I'd imagine we'll remember it, right? But uh, we may at this, this side of eternity think upon those things like, how, what, that wasn't even that big of a deal, but it may change someone. See, in their culture, this is, you know, the, the, the coming of Jesus was extraordinary, right? And, and yet it was anticlimactic. We have the people going, he's, uh, he's came on a donkey. What is this about? You know, the disciples going, wait, you're going to the cross, you're going to die. They're going to be scattered here in just a few days. And he will rise and he will overcome the world and they will not understand until later. Then they go, I get it. Sometimes in our life, walking with the Lord, we go through situations and struggles where you may say, I just don't get it. We may have this moment where we say, Lord, where are you? What's going on? Do not yield. A day will come, brothers and sisters. A day will come where you'll go, I see it now. I understand it may be an eternity, but maybe through a situation this morning, through a moment of evangelism, through planting that seed and praying, maybe there'll be a day where someone comes and they believe and you say, yes. I was unsure for many years. I don't know what to think about this, but this is who God is. I believe as we look at, this, uh, at the disciples lacking understanding and then coming to understanding. Like it teaches us to don't, don't yield. Be unyielding in your conviction. You're following after Christ. It's impossible to please the Lord without faith. Have that faith. I like to use the word grit, right, and put that spiritual, the adjective in front of it. Have spiritual grit. Be confident. Right? He's a king. He's always a king. Coming on a donkey, he's still a king. He's a king who rules in justice and righteousness. There's never a moment that's ever wavered. That's who he is. What can man do to you? Nothing. What can this world give you outside of what Christ has done? Nothing. Hold on to the king. Be unyielding. The second thing we need to see is, is verses 17 and 18. Follow Christ with an undivided heart. Look at the crowd here, right? Therefore, the people who were with him, when they... Uh, when they, excuse me, with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, it bore witness, right? You have people talking, right? Stirring up people. Man, he did this. And for this reason, John tells us, the people also met him, right? Because they heard that he had done this sign, right? Many are coming and saying, man, he raised Lazarus. He was, he was starting to get a little smelly, four days in the tomb, right? And, and he called him out, Man, I was there. You should have saw it. It was incredible, right? Imagine that if you've ever heard that word of mouth kind of thing, right? So you have people coming, right? But they're coming not for the pure reason of, of a Savior, right? They are divided in their attendance here. Hey, I do want to know about uh, this, this moment, Jesus, your power. There's something unique about you. Maybe you can do that power, do something for me in my life. Unfortunately, we can confidently say most of those people aren't looking to salvation as that, as that item. We see that, right, in, in Good Friday, the amount of people who are crying out, crucify him. See, this is a problem that we have, right? The question must be asked of us, and it takes us right back to the, the very problem of the crowd assembling, right? We see it. You know, what do you see in Christ is Christ the Christ of Scripture? Are you coming back to the Bible and saying, this is Jesus who died for me. It's him and him alone. Or is there something else? The prosperity gospel says, yeah, you know, you need Jesus and he'll bless you with all these other things or whatever else. Uh, the, the seeker movement will, will package Jesus as a way, you know, you can just uh, 
drive by, right? And, and here's Jesus. He's in this nice little package and, and all those kind of nice things that go with it. But Jesus himself said in Luke 9, 23 through 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Right? Not once, not last time, not when I prayed that prayer. Daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus isn't talking about salvation. That's in Christ. That's the work of Calvary. He's talking about a disciple who knows the true king. And a disciple who knows the true king says, I want to let go of the world. I'm going to take both of my hands and grab that cross. I'm going to follow my Savior. I'm going to follow him with an undivided heart, an unyielding heart. I'm not going to compromise. The world around us and our culture, they are dying to see something different. You have that answer, right? Your life, you are to be a light that shines, and they know that your light that is shining is because of Christ, because you told them. It's because of Christ. And the world is looking for something, and they have the cares and the baggage of all this uh, stress and uncertainty and doubt and fear, and they're looking somewhere. There's someone, and guess what? You are that messenger, but I can imagine those you come in contact with might question, right, a Savior who can do this if you're not fully devoted. Well, if it's not really worth it to you, why should it be worth it to me? Be unyielding, be undivided in your conviction. We're not talking about legalism. We're talking about operating in, in grace. Because of Christ, because of the freedom he has given me, I get to follow be that follower. And the last point here in verse 19. I say, follow Christ with an encouraged heart. That may seem odd at the, the verse here, and I'll explain it in a moment. But the Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, <laughs> See, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Oh my goodness, it's hilarious. Look, the world has gone after him. How blind is our sin? How, how damaging is it, right, that the Pharisees are looking upon the Savior of the world and days away he's going to overcome this world. And that I, this morning, you as followers of Christ are a part of this world that he accomplished. We're proof of it. Christ is not only on this donkey, he's heading to Calvary and they are saying, you see, you're accomplishing nothing. I don't know, I think he's accomplished quite a bit. You and I are proof of it, right? The church is proof of it. Look at the world going after him. Yeah, I'm part of that world. He has redeemed my life. Isn't it amazing the Pharisees can look upon this and what, see how damaged their sin is? They are trying to scheme and get rid of him. They would rather say, you know what? Let's work with Judas. I got an inside guy. Judas will have him betray Jesus. They're focusing on that instead of the savior of the world who's standing right in front of them on a donkey. He's accomplishing nothing. Jesus himself said in John 16, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. How blind are these guys? How hilarious is this statement? You're accomplishing nothing? Are you kidding me? The same is said today, right? Just this simple Jesus, you Christians, whatever, and he's still accomplishing See, this is the, the beauty of the gospel. Jesus isn't finished yet. Have you figured that out yet? There are other souls who are going to come and believe on the Savior, and he's going to use his church to do it. He's going to use people like you and me. I know some of you are thinking, I don't know if he can use you, Pastor. Yes, he can. <laughs> he's not finished yet. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, he is riding on a donkey. Today he's gone to Calvary. Today salvation is available. Today his arms are open wide. All those who will repent of their sins can come and believe on the Savior. Today he is that. Right now he is that. But a day is coming when he returns. She tells us, I'm coming. He will not be riding a donkey. And be riding a horse. And now we know what that symbolism means. 
John says in Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. The capital letters. We know who we're talking about. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Today he's available. Be encouraged. When we do evangelism, he's available. Jesus tells us in that moment when you're out, you're speaking of him and you're being that light and you're attaching your good works to the name of Jesus Christ, the one of scripture. And we know he's omnipresent, we know he's ever present, but he tells us in those moments, be encouraged, son and daughter, right? I am with you. So today you have the opportunity to say, Jesus is coming. He's come on a donkey. It may not be what you think you need, right, or want, but it's exactly what you need. Right now he's available, but a day is coming where he'll not return on a donkey. Today he's available as a savior. When he comes back, he will be a judge. That Jesus is always a righteous, true, and faithful king. See, he's never wavered in that. And a righteous, true, and faithful king will separate the goats from the donkey. Excuse me, the goats from the sheep. See, eternity depends on this. Knowing Jesus, the true Jesus of Scripture. Not a counterfeit. Not some conjured up Jesus to make us feel better so we can live any way we want. It's a Jesus who changes lives. This is the Jesus we call upon. Let's follow him with a heart that is unyielding, a heart that is undivided, and a heart that is encouraged because he's not finished yet. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for this time that we can assemble on your day and call upon your great name. That we can look upon this moment as Jesus is entering the, the, the Passion Week. How he came in peace and Lord, how he is available today as a savior in peace. And I imagine the crowds that, that went from praising him to calling out crucify him had a lot of other mean things to say about him. But it did not change his pursuit his fulfillment, his obedience to your will, going to Calvary, and upon that cross bore our sins. Lord, thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for saving us. I pray for each of us this morning who know this Savior, Jesus, Lord, as the true King. I pray you would strengthen our hearts. That you let, not let the enemy take this from us, but that we would serve and follow after Christ, unyielding, undivided, strengthened and encouraged in the gospel proclamation. Jesus is not finished yet. He's still available as a Savior. Lord, encourage us with that. I do pray for those here this morning who are unsure of their salvation, or maybe they know they, they don't know. Let today, God, by your Spirit, be a day of salvation. While Jesus is available, Lord, please let today be a day of salvation. For when he returns, he will be on a horse. He will not come in peace. He will make war. So, Lord, let us be sure of our salvation. Let us know in whom we have believed with great confidence. And with that confidence, lead us forward. As a church, Lord, for your glory, help us to do outreach, to grow in our families, Lord, every area. Be glorified. We thank you. We love you. We pray this in the wonderful name, the saving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.